Radio. This is Mike, and uh, while we will be joined eventually by Rich Morrow and probably Ryan McAllister, I am currently joined by Dennis. <laughs> really, Chris, Travis, and today we are doing a little board gaming. We've done card gaming. We've done. Miniatures gaming, today we are doing board gaming, and today we are going to be playing Friedman Fries' Power Grid by Rio Grande Games. I have never touched this game before. I've seen it in stores. I've looked at it. I've had flashbacks to bad Sim City episodes and walked away. So, huh. Well, those flashbacks will return. <laughs> so that they were well-founded, is what you're saying. Huh? Yes. If you like Sim City-esque games and making... Making money and expanding, this is the game for you. <laughs> so let, let's talk a little bit about this um, and what we have here. Now, this will be the first board game, actual traditional board game, we have covered here on the podcast. Although, uh, don't worry, there will be plenty more in the future. But uh, Power Grid is one of the stalwarts. It is one of the you know definitely most identified, identifiable uh, board games out there uh, in the, the realm of the designer board game as in not Monopoly, not Clue, not Scrabble, not the game of life uh, not something that you will typically find in random retail store um, Coop seems to be intimately familiar with this game in that he intends to crush us all <laughs> so, I absolutely love games where you never roll dice Yes, we figured that out from the last episode. So, t tell us a little bit about Power Grid in general. Alright, so the point of this game is to go and build a power plant network and go and power cities around, you know, either the U.S. or Europe or Germany, all depending on the map. Um, and there are and it is a resource a resource management money management and hyper expansionistic game the goal is to expand as fast as, as you can while not going going in you know getting bankrupt and of course the most fun fun part is you know auctioning these uh, power, power plants that go and come up come up and seeing just who who is willing to go and pay way too much for whatever <laughs> they are about to get. But everyone always seems very happy to spend way too much for everything. Well, America. Anyway. <laughs> because 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 you won. You won that 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 auction. It's yes. amazing. Yes. Um I can safely say that this will be the first board game I've played of this particular nature. Uh I generally uh, stick around the co-op or a little bit lighter looking game than what we have here in front of us. I don't think I would classify this just by looking at it as a light game. Uh, Dennis, you're the one that brought this to the party. So, have you ever played Power Grid? I'm assuming you have. You own it. I've played it once. Are you a lying? A long time ago. Are you lying to us right now? No. Okay. Now, <laughs> just so we're clear, once. this is the Deluxe ed 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 Edition. And they have different resource sources so this is a different game from the power plant game that i have played but i'm sure that the primary overarching rules are still the same they just went and changed uh changed trash into gas it looks like so trash oh, yeah. gas <laughs> so we, this is well, yeah you used to have ha have gar garbage plants that oh, that's cool. turn turn uh garbage into power so it seem it seems that they've gone and changed garbage into natural gas. We are playing in this one the deluxe edition, which is the Europe and North American maps, much to Travis's amazement when he originally thought it was America and Germany. I'm guessing that was the original base set was probably just those two countries. Yes, okay. and it, okay. and and it's on a a double sided board just like this one. So. And I've seen plenty of expansions for this, where the, literally the expansion is simply a new board, not unlike Ticket to Ride, really. Correct. So. Uh, so, uh, Chris, uh -huh. you're, you're sitting here looking at this uh, uh, assemblage of strange symbols and words and letters. What <laughs> what do you think? I'm going to lose? Well, yes. We're, we're, we both are. Coop's going to win. We get that up front. No, I mean, we're, I'm just going to We're playing lose. for third. No. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, saying, I'm going to lose. The, I suck at games like this. The upside of this game is that 
it's nigh impossible to not advance. You may not be winning, but you will advance through the game. Okay. So it's it's pre- pretty much impossible to not be able to do anything on a turn. Challenge accepted. Okay. <laughs> So, what do you think looking at this, though, Chris? I mean, is this something, because uh, I'll be honest, we're a little out of my wheelhouse at this point. I was thinking the same thing. I'm, like, I'm not really good at games like this. Never well, have been. Well, we're going to give it a shot, folks. So, when we come back from the break, I do believe that uh, Chris and myself will be crying tears that will fill the cup of Travis Cooper. Oh, there'll be no tears. Ah, huh? yes, the sweet tears of victory. <laughs> there, there, there won't be any tears. He won't get tears from me. That, that's the one thing he'll, ne- he'll never get from me. No. So, no. No, Coop. No. I've, Challenge I've, accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Give me those tears. <laughs> Cry for me. <laughs> Folks, we will be back. YouTube and us both have to pay some bills. We'll be right back with you. Stick around. Hello wrestling fans, Greg Hunter here, one half of the best damn announced team period, along with John the Body Johnson, encouraging you to join us right here exclusively on the ECS Network for the Announcers Booth. Between us, we have over 30 years experience in the world of professional wrestling, and we use that to bring you the insights in the squared circle right here, past, present, and future on the ECS Network. So join myself and John the Body Johnson for the Announcers Booth, only on the ECS Network. And welcome back. Just a few minutes ago, we got done playing a little Power Grid here with the Rage Quit crew. Myself, Rich, Dennis, Chris, and Coop, who much, uh, you know, to Chris's benefit, there were no tears to be had. Damn it. My ha, sweet ha, tears. Ha, my nectar. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so no tears for Coop to consume. Uh, having never played Power Grid before today, I thought it was probably a fairly close game. Be damned if I know. But, uh, but it seemed that way. Let's uh, now. The, the only person in the room that has apparently extensive play experience with the game is Coop, and that was with an older version of the game. Yeah, because as we said, we played the deluxe edition. The deluxe edition has a, a couple of uh, rules changes to it, and also has uh, different maps than the regular base game. As I understand, the base game is just the U.S. and Germany. This version is North America and Europe, so it's a bit larger and so on. But um, all in all. First impressions from those people who have never played the game before. Dennis, it's your game. You brought it with you. So your first impression of the deluxe power grid. Okay. I'll give my first impression, then i got to go. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so um, I thought the game was a lot of fun. There was uh, a lot of interaction between everybody. Um, there wasn't very much time where you could just sit and play on your phone or whatever, unless you did it on purpose and said, hey, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't high, want to participate in this part minute. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's fine, too, because sometimes you have to go to the bathroom, and you can be like, I opt out and come back <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of interaction, and, and there's a lot of uh, opportunity to be an asshole and block people off and hoard resources <laughs> and not let anybody do, do anything. So I think um, it's, it's a nice, fun game to pick up. You can pick it up really easily, and uh, I think there's a lot of depth there, too, for the game. Okay. Chris? Um, I like how fairly fast-paced it was. I mean, primarily once you got the game rolling, I mean, it was like, all right, auction time, all right, resources, all right, you know, we're on to the next step, you know. Five of us here, even with one more person, would have gone fairly quick once we had all the rules down. Um, and I do like the whole take that kind of attitude where I'm like, well, I'm going to go ahead and go here. So you got to wait for round two before you can move here and pay more money or go wherever you need to go. So it's like, well, crap. <laughs> Gotta change strategy real quick. So I like that aspect of it. Rich, your first impressions of Power Grid. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Green power. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> but it was, I'm not that big of a board gamer, but it was fun. Right. I would play it again. I don't know if it's a game I would buy, but I would definitely play it again. Okay. Uh, anything in it that you particularly liked that just struck you quickly? The green power plants are sweet. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> um, for myself, um, it is it is one of those games where looks are deceiving. It looks far more complicated than it is. And, and should probably make a distinction between something being complicated and complex, as Dennis bails on us. 
a game can be complicated while still looking really simple and not being overly complex. A lot of times, to me, a game that is complicated is a result of really badly written rules. Uh, a game that is complex can be incredibly simple. The complexity should come from the decisions being made, not the bad rules. Yeah. And I think that's what you have here. Is that It is a game that is complex, not complicated. There's a lot of choices to be made. Um, it There's not a lot of moving parts. And I really enjoyed the auction mechanisms and, and kind of the resource mechanisms a lot more than I thought I would. Because I stayed away from Power Grid like the Plague for a long time. I would actually play it again. I would even consider purchasing it at this point. So, um, Coop, your thoughts on Power Grid? Just a, a brief kind of... I went and played the older version of the game, and uh, I like the new maps. They seem to have gotten rebalanced some of the hyper-expansionistic uh, plays that were possible in the older versions, which which were, you know, a unfairness for some folks, but uh, it seems that they went and revised the power plants and the rules a bit to go and hopefully streamline things, but they still, to this day, have not gone and made a clear-cut rules for how to go and correctly do the power plant stacking. Uh, like, to go and make that deck, because I'm not not sure sure of one thing, but whether you do it exactly the way they say in the rules or if you go and interpret it a different way, it doesn't really change the overall outcome of the game. You know, just, it would change the flow of the game. Yeah, it, 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 it would just slightly change the flow of, of the game instead, instead, instead of there being, you know, very jagged spikes like there were in the uh, game we went and played uh, tonight. I've actually never seen a game of power power grid go like like tonight where we literally wouldn't skip one entire auction phase because no one wanted to because everyone had shit tons of power and no interest in getting new power plants because they had not expanded enough mm. well i just to give kind of a brief for people who've never played uh, power grid have no idea the way it works essentially you have a map uh, in this case we we're playing on europe and there are a number of cities each city on the map has three available spots for power plants costing 10, 15, or 20, depending on whether you're the first, second, or third person to build there. The object is to be the first one to a predetermined number of power plants actively powered. Uh, so in a five-player game like we were playing, that would be uh, 15 power plants. And if you're the person that has 15 power plants first that are all powered, that becomes the last round of the game. And we're off essentially. Um, hmm. The game itself is, you know, each turn is broken down into a number of phases. Turn order is dependent upon who at that point in time has the most powered power plants. So whoever has the most powered power plants going down to whoever has the least number of powered plants will wind up doing the auction first, which is where you actually purchase the plants you're going to be using to power your cities. Uh, once the auction is completed, everyone has purchased at least one power plant then you proceed to buy the resources that those plants consume. Resources will get more expensive the more they have been bought. Uh, and that goes in reverse order. So whoever has the least number of active plants to whoever has, or active cities rather, to whoever has the most. And then once you've bought your resources, then you can expand into more cities. It costs you ever how much the first open slot in the city is, whether it's 10, 15, or 20, plus the connection cost from city to city. They're like little power lines, so to speak, drawn from one to the next, and that tells you how much you're looking at. So that's the general gist of a uh, power plant. And once you've done that, then, or power grid, rather, once you've done all of that, you've bought your resources, you've expanded <laughs> your cities, then you do all your calculations, refill power plants, refill the supplies, so on and so forth, then you're done you move on to the next turn. Wash, rinse, repeat. So, I will say, uh, personally, I liked the mechanisms in the game. I've played way too many board games where you have to play through two or three turns to actually get a feel for this is how the game works. Um, this took one. Yeah. It was not a complicated game at all. Once, once we saw one turn in action, like, okay, I get this. I may not know how the hell to win, 
But, but I understand yeah. the mechanics enough to pick it up. Yeah, because the goal of the game and the mechanics of the game literally stay the same the entire time. There's no, like, super weird rules. And there is a gate, you know, on tur turn five before you can go and build into other people's uh, you know, cities, cities, but typically around turn five is when you would actually be able to afford that in the first place. Right. So the gate, the gateway is to go and just uh, stop, stop you know, really juvenile bunching up of things, and right. it's really not much of a a hardship unless you actively go and put put yourself in a situation where it becomes a problem, like, like if you're Chris. in Dublin. Yes, like if you start in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I, I would say I like the scarcity of the game. That's actually something I enjoy. Is that a rip at me? Really? No, it wasn't a rip at you. It was an, It was actually a flat-out insult. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I enjoyed the scarcity of the game, so to speak. How the game... It doesn't feel like artificially contrived limitations the game imposes upon you. Um, you have territories on the map. Certain territories, depending on the number of players, are eliminated from the game from the word go. You can't ever go there. That makes sense to me because otherwise the players wouldn't interact. So I get that. It, it's like a scenario in War Machine. It, it's like any number of other things in any other game. Well, it also goes and alters how people will end up playing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you go and exile the more cost-efficient zones, mm -hmm. then the expansionistic plays and plans you know, become really difficult to go and pull off. Right. I enjoyed the idea of the... Uh, I like the auction. I've, this first game I played with an auction mechanic. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very simple. Worked well. And the resources, uh, you know, where the more they've been bought, the more expensive they become. It makes sense, because that's the way the economy works. So, supply and demand sort of deal. So, the more scarce it is, the more expensive it is. I, I enjoyed that particular piece there. Uh, Rich over here, who's not talking very much, but... Yeah, green is good. Green power plants don't require any resource to use. They're just air-powered, and you never have to buy resources for them. Rich started racking up on those early. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, another interesting thing about the game is the way that they manage the catch-up mechanic in the game. Mm -hmm. Because if you are winning, then you go first. Going first is pretty, 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 pretty much you know, bad. It is the worst thing you can possibly do because you have last pick to go and perform all of your actions. Mm -hmm. which, so, is, which is a way of thinking about it because, I mean, I could have... I was not doing too bad at catching up. I mean... Correct, because you went and got... Because if you get to go and buy all of your resources first, you get, yep. it, you get them all for cheaper. And it makes it more expensive for everyone, you know, who is... So it's cheaper for you and more expensive for everyone who is, you know, ahead of you. Also, you get to go and expand first, mm -hmm. which means that you can go and, you know, have the more the more cost-effective, you know, expansions first uh, during the turn so that you don't get blocked out, which for, forces the winning players to have to spend more to go and expand. So there is a there is a catch-up mechanic in the game. Now, of course, you know, expanding and getting more money is always good, but... Just because you're a little bit behind does not mean that you're completely out out of it because the other person is making more money. At no That's point, true. At no point in this game did I feel like I was out of the game. Which is something I've played way too many games where at a certain point you're just sitting there going, like, okay, make up my own win condition. Because there's no way I'm winning. So, well, now granted, Chris did that from the word go because he wanted all of the UK. And I think he, did you ever build it in Glasgow? Yeah, I got it all. Okay, so he got all of the UK at some point. Okay, fine. Yeah, and oddly enough, if he had just started in London first... I See, that was my thought like, process. Like, like I, you, you, you actually probably would have been a full turn ahead. Ahead of, of yeah. Your uh, thoughts on some of the mechanics and such in the game, Chris? I mean... Shoot, I mean Anything stick out to you as, as really good? Something that you don't normally see? Now, granted, our board game experience is, as a whole is probably a little limited, but... It is. I mean, the... I, to be honest, don't play too many of the board games. I mean, at all to really give any comparison. Um, but I thought it 
to me, it just, the game just flowed really well. I mean, nothing, nothing, not one piece of this game stood out more than the other. I thought the game as a whole was, to me, just good. Like, they thought, like, the play, probably their play testing when they were making this game and whatnot did fairly well. That the fact that they fixed some kinks that may have been iffy in the first set, said, hey, here's the deluxe edition with our new fixes. And, um, uh, that's what we got, you know, really good out of it. Uh, but I couldn't necessarily tell you much else I'd say was positive, specifically, for me, anyways. So, what, what The most mean? interesting thing from my experience, I play a lot of board games with, uh, another group, group of my friends, you know, on the weekends, and of all the games that I play... This is the one that has one of the most streamlined catch-up mechanics. Mm -hmm. So that even if you did have a bad turn or things did not go and pan out, it's very possible that your mistake will end up, you know, in the long run being very effective. Yeah, and there are games I've played like Ticket to Ride where... The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And if you screw up a wrong position or build a route wrong, you are boned. You won't even be close in this game. I've seen, you know, that's the one example that comes to mind immediately. And I've played others that I know I felt like at different points going, I'm really just sitting here goofing off at this point. But this one, uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that catch-up mechanic works really, really well. It's not a rich get richer game. Because if you're dead last, you're paying more for every damn thing else. Correct. So. Be because being being the first player, you go and buy everything last. Also, right. the later on, the later on cities you build return less income to you. They are most likely a lot more expensive. Yeah. Uh, your resources are a lot more. And actually, in the game we just played, on the last turn, uh, Dennis was actually able to go and tie, tie me for points. Yep. But like he, like I, I was at eleven points. He was at nine points, and he went and built four cities on the last turn to tie tie me for points. And it came down to the money tiebreaker is for me actually, you know, winning. Right. So I mean, it's a it's a really cool game. I like it a lot as far as the mechanics and such. Uh, sort of just and uh, I will say this because not something we talk about a great deal in this game. The quality of that deluxe box was really nice. Now, I've never seen the original box, so I don't have anything to compare it to, but the components felt really awesome. The only major difference mm -hmm. between the old box and the new box is that uh, the old the old box had, uh, had you know, like, pay, paper monopoly money to go and represent the, the electros you go and make, the man, mm -hmm. the, which uh, in that game they, they're actually called, called man hours. You go and generate, you know, uh, you know, a number of man hours of work to go and get your, to go and represent your money. Hmm. Uh, so they they wouldn't change the name to Electros, but the pay scale is exactly the same as the old game, which which is good. It it build building your first few cities is supposed to be super rewarding, and right. your build building your thirteenth and fourteenth city is supposed to be less so. Right. Well, uh, but I thought the component quality was very good. Um, I'll be honest, if I was going to knock something in the game, and, and we'll get to our negatives now, if I was going to knock something, actually the money would be the only component that I would think I would rather have had the paper money. Yep. Um, I, do, I do not like, because the mon money in the deluxe edition is basically plastic chips, and the varying colors, but they're all the same size. Even if it had been something as simple as they had been different sizes of chips to help, you know, at least make the sorting easier. Or even if the color differential between the chips was better because the colors are gray, light green, dark green, and black. That didn't bother me as much. I mean, I can see how it bothers some people, especially if you're colorblind, you're screwed. Especially since but, the, the denominations did not go in color order. Either. No. Yeah. So, I mean, I... I felt uh, that to me would be a sticking point that I just do not care for overly much, um, and it's a it is a very non confrontational game. The way you screw with somebody is during your turn you put something where they want to put it, uh, but that's there's no kind of confrontation. Uh, 
I don't I don't think the game would need something like that, but I wonder if they've ever implemented it in an expansion, if there was any kind of way to play around with that a little bit. I've but, never heard of a expansion for for the old version of this game. That added any kind of any Nothing kind of interaction. Added uh, I've, I've never heard Beyond of just a map. map. I've never heard of even additional maps. Well, I know they make additional maps. Okay. Um, then that's prob- probably the di- the differentiation because just by changing the layout and the connection costs can go and change how the game plays out substantially. Yeah, I know there are a number of expansions for Power Grid. I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Really? Yeah. Chris, if you had to knock the game for something, what are you knocking it for? Uh, Dublin sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that'd be about right. Um, oh my god! But um, eh? continue. I'll, I'll uh, say this in okay. A um, I guess you know, choose your places wisely. Because I was <laughs> like, to be honest, I couldn't really say much more than what you said for money. I mean, but other than that, you know. I don't really have anything bad to really say about the game, personally, but... Yeah, there is an issue where having... If you... The very first time you play the game, if you aren't you told that the initial location you go and pick, um, you want to go and pick somewhere that will allow you ease of expansion, at least at the beginning, so as to go and bankroll yourself enough that you can expand it to the more expensive locales. <clears throat> yeah. I'm just I'm looking at um, a online retailer uh, website for Power Grid. There are 12 expansions for this game. Um, the vast majority of them are simply other maps. So um, you can play uh, the other maps. There's they're all double sided. So one of them is Benelux or Central Europe. One of them is Brazil and Iberia. One of them is India and Australia. One of them is Italy and France. One of them is Korea and China. There's Northern Europe plus UK Ireland. There's Quebec, seems random, uh, plus, <laughs> I'm just be honest, I would expect Canada, not Quebec, Quebec. but uh, Quebec slash uh, Baden-Württemberg, uh, Russia slash Japan, and then there are, uh, looks like, three like legitimate expansions beyond just maps. One of them is nothing more than new power plant cards. And then there is one here called the Robot Expansion, which includes uh, rules for adding robot players to the game. All hail your robot overlords. Yes. Robot players? Yeah, oh. I, guess, I guess so you can have a six-player game even if there's only three of you. Okay. And then there's one called the Stock Companies Expansion. So um, essentially it gives you another way to earn money. So... Yeah, looks looks interesting. Joe has also entered the room, by the way. Joe Budnick. Uh, he, he showed up after we got done playing. Hey, we, we could have turned it into a guessing game. Why would you give it up now? Well, uh, because. Um, <laughs> Heck, I would have left it as an Easter egg and just wandered through to see well, who guessed who, uh, who showed up. But I asked because have you ever played Power Grid? I have not. Okay. Sadly. Thank you for the contribution. Um, <laughs> I, was, I may edit it out now so that it is an Easter egg. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, although I think you would like it. It seems like a game that is your speed that, that you would enjoy. Um, well, to make one comment about it, though, you mentioned non confrontational and the whole you put something where other people want to get it. Mm. No offense, that's the whole confrontational aspect of, say, Ticket to Ride, since you brought that up. And that game can ruin friendships because yes, of that. So but they, they, When I say confrontation in a game, there's confrontation that is a built-in mechanic of the game, such as I attack you. Oh, true. Then there's a confrontation as in, you put that where I want it to go, you son of a bitch. Or you That's... or you went and pushed up the auction on this uh, power plant I really wanted to buy. Yeah. Like, th- those are natural confrontations that come from playing a free market game, basically. Yeah. It's not something, it's not a, a confrontation that is a game mechanic meant to create a conflict between you and me. It's an interaction of the game that's going to happen, and if there's going to be conflict, then it's going to be outside of the game. It's not going to have any impact on the game beyond we just start fucking with each other. (laughs) And again, the game paces that uh, conflict at certain points where it goes and gates you 
before you can go and then just build where they where your uh, you know asshole friend went and built beforehand. Yeah. So you'll just have to wait a turn or two before you go and build where you wanted to build for a slightly higher fee. As this goes up, Richard, I know you don't play a lot of board games at all, but looking at this one, you had made the mention that you, you're, this is not something you think you would buy. If there was something you were going to that you don't like about this game. Uh, I mean, well, first of all, it's a game about building power plants. That's about as interesting as taking a dump. To me. Fair. I mean, I, the game no, the, is fun, but... The theme doesn't work for you. Well, that, and, like, honestly, and I may be a little out of line here, and there are some better, some worse, but it feels like every economy game I've ever played at the same time. Hmm. Well, there's going to be similarities, I'm sure. This is about the first one I've played. Well, so. nothing, nothing in this particular version caught me as something I couldn't do in a different game. Like, me and Cooper were talking about, um, what was the name of the one we talked about earlier that Nathan had that we played? Sand People, Mermaids. Oh, uh, Small World. Uh, Small World is probably my favorite economy game I've played. It seems like there's a lot more going on. Um, once again, the game is not bad. I'm not yeah. guessing it. I'm just saying it feels a lot like most economy games, and it, maybe that's just the fact that I don't play a lot of board sure. games. But um, th- that's just my two cents. Well, you're also spoiled because Small World is a really good game as well. I have gone and played a lot of really bad economy games that take a really long time to play, are really frustrated, and by the end of it, no one had fun, especially the winner. Well, I've never played a game of um, Small World where that's happened. It's always been a good game that I've enjoyed. Well, yeah, it's also the, the time frame aspect. There are... A, a lot of older economy-based games that you know take you know between two and four hours to go and play through, and as Joe Winston mentioned, there's a lot of a built-in conflict gen- generation mechanics between the players that are just aggravating until it gets to the point, like Mike said, where you know who's going to win, and there's absolutely nothing that anyone can do to stop them. But you still have to go through the freaking motions and, and anyway, and there's no good catch-up mechanic in those games. In Small World, there's no good catch-up mechanic either, in my opinion. Well, let's take a look here. Final thoughts on Power Grid? Chris, your final thoughts. I think we've probably already heard Riches to a point. I mean, it's good. That's about all we're getting out of that. I mean... Is it something that you would spend money on? No. No, <laughs> he says emphatically. Like, no, <laughs> it doesn't have awesome miniatures. <laughs> that's not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that, then Rich is done. At that point. I mean, that's the problem for Rich. I mean, if if you were building, you know, giant mecha that had to go and fight each other, then no, that's a different that, that's story. That's not a fair statement. Like Sentinels of the Multiverse has no figures, and I love it. Um, the High Command, no figures, but I love it. Like I just. It, I guess to me, like it seems really real worldy. I'm just not super into that stuff. I'm like, I can just go to do power and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so to you, it, it, to you, it falls down to mostly theme. Yeah, it's mostly theme. Yeah. Theme and the lack and of once a again, fant- I would uh, play this element. game again. Like if someone had a copy of the card, let's play a board game. Like I would pick that over some other board games. I just mm. would not go buy it. Like, okay. It's not something that would ever just get played at my house with the people that are there more than others. So I will say this: I enjoyed it. Um, I not only would buy it, I probably will buy it at some point. I actually did enjoy the game that much because it's it's a really nice board game where it's got a lot of depth. The replayability comes from the people you play with, not any artificial other BS. And I I like that. And I also appreciate uh, the fact that as like I said earlier, as complex as it is, it is not complicated. It is in, it seems like it would be incredibly simple to teach because you everybody here got caught on to it within twenty minutes. So yeah, it took one turn of playthrough, and everyone knew what was going on. Right. Like, and the only complication that we had during the game was me being unsure about whether I went and did the power plants correctly at the beginning of the yeah. game. That was the only thing, because it was kind of weird wording in the book. Right. And, and honestly, I didn't I didn't get to really talk much on the positives. I mean, oh, yes, but, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it, it, I 100% agree with Coop. Like, there's a huge draw to a game that takes one round and four people who haven't played it know how to play it. 
um, anyone who's ever tried to sit through Twilight Imperium and learn that oh knows what God. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Like I love to hate that game. <laughs> <laughs> I have considered because that game gets a lot of positive press. I have considered trying to it, find someone that has a copy of TI three. By who? I don't know. Who? I don't, who goes and writes good reviews for that game? Oh, dude! At one point, hold on. Um, the, the game itself is not bad. No, there are if you're playing like with four other people and everyone knows exactly what they're doing. Yeah. If you play with anyone who has not played it, shoot yourself in the yeah. head and save yourself. It also game, it's also a game for not casual board gamers. Correct. You are absolutely correct in that. I mean, there are people who, who absolutely love that game. As I understand it, this is probably the best way to phrase it, and I'm stealing this from another from another podcast when I say this, and uh, uh, frankly, a far better podcast than ours. Um, if you... Uh, no, we'll get I'll, there. No, I'll I'll say that up front. That would opinions be a, are like assholes. Yes, everybody's got one, and most of them stink. But um, <laughs> <laughs> and Richard's right here for us. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, Ti Three is very high regard. Like the Dice Tower, a lot of their guys really really love that game. But everyone who speaks highly of that game will say what you just said, which is it is a wonderful game if you're playing it with a group of people that know how to play it. The second that game gets... If you have one person at the table that does not know how to play, apparently that game bogs down into absolute tedium. So, and I was getting it mixed up with something else, because the actual... I, for some reason in my head, I was thinking that it was the number one game on Board Game Geek right now. It's not. Actually, the number one game on Board Game Geek is Twilight Struggle, which I... It falls, into, that, but... it falls into the same category. People who love it who love the hell out of it. People that hate it don't play it. And therefore, it, it's kind of number one for that reason. The number two game on Board Game Geek, though, we will actually wind up talking about on this show with some regularity because that will be Pandemic Legacy. Um, I so want to go and play either that that Legacy or Risk Legacy and just watch as we go and set the world on fire. <laughs> I'm to bring that up. Yeah, so uh, uh, remind me to tell you what, what we're doing after we get off the mics. Um, but anywho, folks, uh, my last impression, like I said, well, I gave my last impressions. Your last impressions, final thoughts on on Power Grid. Um, I've already been a strong proponent of the game. The biggest thing that I liked about the game is that whether you're winning or losing, it's not a high-stress game. It no, keeps your attention because there are rules going on that you have to go and pay attention to, such as the auction. Mm -hmm. And then it very quickly becomes your turn, then it becomes the next phase, and then it's the next turn. If everyone... The slowest turn we had was the first turn. It took us about 15 minutes. Every turn after that took between 5 and 10. And, and we went and finished the game on, like, turn turn 7 or 8. Yeah. And that went to me, means that if you are playing with a bunch of people who have played the game before, you can go and play an entire game in 30 to 40 minutes. Which is another huge plus. Yeah, and quickness yeah. in a board and game is. I great. I went and taught everyone how to play, and we still went and finished the game in under an hour. Yeah, that is amazing yeah. compared to a lot a lot of games where it's like you have to go and teach someone how how to play. Then it takes two to two and a half hours as everyone's like, oh, I didn't really understand this role. Oh, so that's how this works. Oh, so. Yeah. That is exactly why I love what is not actually the greatest board game in the world, but it's super fun. It's King of Tokyo. Like you somebody bust that out, you just play it, and yeah. it's over, and it's it's like, it's a nice fight. You can get like three in in twenty minutes, no joke. Exactly. So, folks, before we end this episode of Rage Quit Radio, the next time now, of course, as all of you know out there in, in YouTube land. Uh, and Radio Land is that we record these uh, a number of them at a time. We've actually been posting on Facebook throughout the day uh, with the games we've been playing. Hmm. Our next recording is going to fall on the Coop's birthday. Woo! The Coop. So, dun, dun, dun. Now, it is entirely possible that the Coop will be off getting drunk somewhere, I imagine. But I might go and delay that until after board games and uh, okay. race quit. Fair. Somehow, I, I don't know how that... It's a deer skin. It, it, it could be that the coop will simply bring the, the percentage The percentage, the percentage of coop going out and those. getting drunk coop. is about as high as the percentage of rain tomorrow in South Carolina. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> I will be drinking on my birthday. Somewhere. But... Uh, we do. We typically record two episodes per day uh, that we do a recording session. 
and that means we're playing two games per day. So coop, uh, this very rarely happens. Carte blanche, you get to call one of the games we will record next time. It doesn't have to be something on my shelf. It can be something you own. It can be something Doug, Doug Doug Goose, man. There is a strong <laughs> likelihood that it has some sort of pandemic in the name. So it might be <laughs> so it might be risk legacy or pandemic legacy or some other, you know, just Give me give me a backup for pandemic legacy. Uh Well he did. Risk, risk legacy, legacy, which no, I don't own. And I was going to get anyway, so hey oh, okay. well, that just advanced that timetable. Hopefully I'll be able to be here in light today. But but, um, but if um I'll ask this. If assuming that we don't play a legacy game, worst case, mm. will there are plenty of deck builder games we could go and play. I don't know how many of those we have gone and reviewed already. No. Legendary, legendary, is the base set of legendary. Okay, then there are plenty of other deck builder games that we can go and review, and I enjoy all of those. Okay, so I've tried to put Coop on the spot. He has wormed his way out, but apparently our backup is a deck building game. Okay. So, generic deck building game. I mean, so. plus I can go and drink and play those games, you know, pretty optimally. <laughs> I think you have an excuse to bring your, like, uh, hentai nurse uh, deck building game now. That game is hilarious. It's is that Tonto Curry? Although I yeah. like the, Tonto Curry. I don't, you I are the master really of the house. Although I like the, uh, the Norse mythology one better. I couldn't get that one. I, I, I really wish you, I could. I think you would really dig Machi Kuro. But... Hmm. I'll tell you about it. Okay. okay. So, yeah, folks, just... with uh, all that said, we hope that you've enjoyed this episode of Rage Quit Radio. Of course, uh, check out all the great shows on the ECS network. Uh, Electric City Sentai, Denzi Caster, the announcer's booth has now joined the ECS network as well. And hey. uh, Oh, shut up, Penguin. And, uh, <laughs> and all those great shows. So check those out. And, of course... Don't forget to come and check us uh, out again in a couple of weeks because we are here at least twice a month now. Uh, also, by the time this airs, uh, there might be some video stuff up on the site too. If there's not, there probably will be soon. We're hoping, fingers crossed, if the production quality looks, um, I'm not even going to say decent. If it will not make your eyes bleed, it might be on the on the, the YouTube channel. Bleeding's okay. Exploding is too much. <laughs> Fair. So with that said, folks, until next time, I'm Mike, Travis, Rich, Rich. Chris, (laughs) and Joe. We'll see you next time on Rage Quit Radio.